Hello everyone, thank you for joining our webinar, How to Promote Better Food Safety with Proper Maintenance Practices, hosted by Dr. Doug Marshall of Eurofins and Rudy Grappi of Heinz and Manufacturing. I'm Genevieve Randall and I'll be moderating this webinar. Before we begin, I'll let you know more about how this webinar will run. The webinar is being recorded and the slides and recording will be available to, for you in three business days. A Q&A session will follow the presentation to answer any viewer submitted questions. During this webinar, you can submit questions you have using the webinar sidebar menu. Select the questions tab, type in your question, then hit the enter key on your keyboard. Remember, you can submit questions throughout the presentations. Now I'll give a quick overview of Eurofins. Eurofins is driven by our mission to contribute to global health by offering the highest quality testing, training, auditing, and consulting services. We strive to listen to our customers and not simply meet, but exceed their expectations. Our footprint is global with 35,000 staff and 400 laboratories across 44 countries and a portfolio of over 150,000 analytical methods. Eurofins provides a unique range of analytical testing services to the pharmaceutical, food, environmental, and consumer products industries and to governments. Now, I, we will be launching a polling question. Our first polling question is, do you hold your maintenance crew to the same hygienic standards as your production crew? And now you should be able to vote. I'll leave this polling question open for about 30 seconds, and then I'll share the results. Okay. Now I'm going to close the poll, and you can see the results here, with 85% saying yes and 15% saying no. All right, now Doug, you can start your presentation. Hey, thanks Genevieve. Um, appreciate everybody's interest in this uh, webinar topic. I know many of you uh, attend a lot of these, so. Uh, we're going to take a little different angle on uh, improving food safety practices by really uh, focusing on um, better maintenance practices to ensure food safety. So appreciate everybody's time. Next, please. So um, maintenance practices are good um, because it keeps facilities operational, whether you're a food manufacturer, you're environmental. Um, remediation uh, business, or if you're in pharmaceuticals. Next, please. So, uh, going to give you a few uh, background slides just on how we manage food safety in food manufacturing sites. We have four main pillars of food safety that ensure that the uh, products are being uh, operated in a, in a safe uh, environment. So good manufacturing practices, and so your maintenance crew has a huge impact on whether or not uh, your GMPs are, are working well. We have your standard sanitary operating procedures. So again, maintenance crew uh, might be important in terms of uh, getting access to cleaning and sanitation uh, during those routine operations. And then in terms of your uh, process controls through HACCP, uh, certainly we need to make sure that our um, critical controls are working, and then we monitor the success of these programs by looking at environmental monitoring. Next. So uh, in terms of uh, your preventative control programs, we've got training programs for managers or workers, so clearly your attendance at this webinar is important for you to maintain that. And then we have a bunch of other things that involve testing. Obviously, I work for Eurofin, so we think testing is an important part of getting data points to help you validate and verify whether your preventative control programs are working or not. Next, please. Yep, 
the importance of maintenance can be um, looked at just in terms of its contribution to food safety. So we have a, a few outbreaks that have been directly linked to poor maintenance practices. Here are a couple of those. So a poor physical plant was um, uh, led to uh, salmonella in peanut butter because there was widespread bird infestation. So the maintenance crew was simply not able to uh, keep birds from out of the facility. Uh, we have listeria outbreak and ready to eat meats, and this was linked to the removal of a cooling unit that disrupted harbor sites of listeria in that environment. And then we had an outbreak in cereal, and there's a, a new one that, that happened this summer. But the problem here was a roof leak allowed for uh, salmonella that was in uh, bird poop on the roof to gain access uh, into the facility. Next, please. So what we don't want to be is in a situation where uh, we look at our maintenance crew members and we have to start asking questions about whether they are focused only on production or do they also have a focus on food safety. So certainly the intent of this webinar is to ensure that you've got uh, the ammunition to um, uh, encourage your maintenance activities to focus on food safety. So why would you want to test for pathogens or allergens? Obviously, these are food safety components that can be found on a, uh, improperly uh, maintained equipment. And the primary reason is to protect your brand and to reduce your liability. In some circumstances, there's a regulatory expectation. Uh, most of the time, you're trying to validate the effectiveness of your preventative controls and uh, uh, also helps you to do compliance and outbreak investigations when you have an issue. Next, please. If you decide that the cost of testing is an expense your company would rather not bear, what are you now um, increasing in terms of your risk profile? Well, obviously, you have the potential for injuring or killing your customer. This is not a long-term successful marketing strategy to sell your products. Uh, you, 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 lose your facility and lose your business and lose your job. And with the ability of FDA to actually prosecute you now for um, criminal negligence, um, I would say that uh, without these data points, you have very little liability protection. And I would say that uh, if you're not following best industry practices, you're not being prudent and the plaintiff's lawyer can uh, really sock it to you. So when you're looking at your maintenance practices, we can simplify the kinds of food safety risks that are important by focusing on uh, the following three um, uh, food safety uh, outbreak causes, and also they cause a lot of recalls. Salmonella is your primary target organism in manufacturing environments that have low moisture in the, in the facility. So you may be only doing dry cleaning, and you may be only doing dry processing. On the other hand, Listeria monocytogenes is the target organism for environmental monitoring in um, areas that are wet processing or have um, wet cleaning and sanitation. And then we have the potential for unintended allergens to be present on equipment surfaces that um, might be um, retained in those surfaces during the process changeover or during the cleanup. Now then, does this mean that we can ignore all the other food safety risks? And the answer is no. But if you're doing a good job controlling um, one or more of these food safety risks, then I think you're going to be doing a good job controlling things like E. coli, Shigella, and the other food safety issues that might be associated with your facility. And what maintenance crews really have uh, a huge impact on, and that is the control of biofilms. Biofilms are a, um, a mass of microbial cells, and if they're pathogenic cells, these become very resistant to cleaning and sanitation activities. And if you cannot break down equipment suitable to be able to clean and sanitize those surfaces, then biofilms can be a huge risk. And Rudy will uh, 
give you a lot of advice on how to work through these. Next, please. One thing that frequently is overlooked because people have a hard time understanding its impact, and that's maintaining an appropriate climate within a food processing facility. So this is important because microbes need food, they need water, and they need a, a suitable temperature. So if you have a very humid manufacturing environment, you're going to have the opportunity for water collecting on surfaces. If you have residual food on those surfaces, then microbes can potentially grow and get to high population levels just based on the climatic conditions in a facility. So those conditions need to be appropriately maintained to ensure you've got control of microbes in that environment. Next. Um, we advocate uh, looking at the risk profile in a facility by doing hygienic zoning. So here's an example of a four zone concept. Um, you could do a two zone concept. So these would be any um, pieces of equipment that have surfaces that have direct contact with food. And then the other zone would be any surfaces that don't have direct product contact. Or you could get uh, a little more sophisticated and go out to four zones. I know some people do three, I know some folks do six. But again, the, the high risk area in this example is going to be zone one. So this is where you have direct product contact surfaces. Next, please. So I want to give you some examples where if you've got um, frequent maintenance activities on these surfaces, then you have opportunities for cross-contamination with pathogens or cross-contact with unwanted allergens. And you need to make sure that after those maintenance activities, appropriate cleaning and sanitation is done to bring those uh, surfaces back into hygienic standards to restart production. So things like uh, tables, conveyor belts, buckets, fillers, hoppers, utensils, and employee hands and gloves, all of these have potential to have direct product contact. So these are going to be your highest risk services. Next. Zone two surfaces, these are going to be surfaces that might be in close proximity to zone one. So these could be equipment frames, strip shields and pans, uh, computer screens. And then down here at the bottom, I've got maintenance tools. So in and of themselves, they might not be uh, very high risk, but if they get uh, contaminated and then they're used on zone one surfaces, then that risk profile greatly goes up. Next, please. Zone so three surfaces, these are going to be areas uh, further removed. So these can include floors, walls, ceilings, and so forth. Um, if you have dilapidated um, uh, surfaces, such as drains, hoses, um, uh, air handling units, equip cleaning equipment, then these can all serve as vectors to transport pathogens to zone one surfaces. And your maintenance activities on these kinds of things are very important to keep them in good hygienic um, working order. Next, please. Here are some more examples, again, um, things that uh, are further removed from direct product contact. But if these areas are contaminated, then it's, there is potential for these organisms to get back on the surface. With allergens, it's far more unlikely. What you're really looking for is residual food residue on surfaces after a process changeover. Next, please. And then so for these are going to be areas outside of the main processing room. And the risk profile is, is quite low. But I've got uh, the maintenance shop in there because what happens in there, if you're bringing uh, equipment or uh, utensils that are used for maintenance into this maintenance shop and then bringing those back out on the production floor, the hygienic condition in that maintenance shop can be, uh, or lack of hygienic condition in that maintenance shop can have impacts on what happens on direct product contact surfaces. Next, please. Um, Rudy's gonna also talk about the importance of plant mapping, but uh, I wanna use this as an example. So let's say you've got a, a facility here and uh, your maintenance crew is going to be uh, traversing in and out of this facility during uh, production or uh, before or after production. 
And the little round uh, black ovals with the white dot on it would be floor drains. And the next slide shows that uh, where these workers go can have a huge impact. So if they're crossing a dirty floor drain or coming in uh, close proximity and then working on direct product contact surfaces, um, that traffic behavior can have an impact on cross-contamination or allergen cross-contact. Next, please. So when I get asked to go into facilities and help with remediation activities, uh, these are some examples of where I would look for uh, the possible presence of um, allergens and or uh, pathogens. And uh, you can look at some of these and think about, you know, okay, inside a disassembled pump. So someone has to disassemble that pump. Is it production or is it maintenance? And during that disassembly process, it might be very important to disassemble that pump to get it cleaned and sanitized. So somebody's got to have a responsibility for doing that disassembly and then um, making sure that it's sanitarily reassembled prior to production. If you have other issues, such as poorly sealed wall and floor junctions, leaky roofs, leaky drain pipes, these are all maintenance issues that have contributed to um, recalls and, and foodborne outbreaks. Next, please. Um, I'll show you some pictures, but I just want to put these in, in, in words for you to think about. If you've got uh, empty bolt holes or open tube support uh, legs, these can uh, be capture points for food, for water, and for microbes. And any time that um, uh, is present, you could get prolific biofilm formation. And any time that biofilm is disrupted, then the pathogens can exit these uh, harborage points and gain access to your products. Next, please. Um, these are pretty self-explanatory, but um, these are often areas that are ignored during routine cleaning and sanitation. But if you have activities that bring these pathogens back into the facility, they can be uh, uh, very important vector points. Next, please. So here are some pictures, and uh, there's just a few points I want to make about these that uh, kind of become some learning items. Yeah, when you're doing environmental monitoring, uh, if these tools are being used for direct product contact, then I think you should argue that these tools also might be zone one surfaces. So if you want to collect an environmental sample from these tools and the tools are locked in a, in a storage box, how do you get access to take the samples? And so you'll have to have a good relationship with your maintenance team because uh, the reason why they keep these tools locked because they tend to walk away, and this is a way that uh, this crew can uh, ensure they have availability of these tools and they're not wasting money by people that are swiping the tools. And in this case, in this picture, you can see that there is a uh, padlock on the storage gate that you would need to somehow get access to collect an environmental sample. Here's an example of a, um, of a quick maintenance fix on a, a joint between two pieces of equipment. So you can see on the right side of this picture a nice continuous uh, weld, but now you've got a correction where you've got a really sloppy spot weld, and all these cracks and crevices in that spot weld can be harborage points. I mean, they're going to be incredibly difficult to clean and sanitize. And if you have Joey or Janie with a high-pressure air hose or a high-pressure water hose doing cleanup, Anytime that water hose hits those cracks and crevices, they're going to aerosolize uh, embedded microbes or perhaps uh, embedded allergens. It's going to be spread all throughout the facility during that activity. Next, please. You've got, uh, here's the worst of all possible examples. You've got open tube framing. So uh, unless those open holes are clearly um, closed, Food, pathogens, and water can get in there and you can get prolific microbial growth. And then you've got empty bolt holes also there that could also be a, a, a major mess for you.
forward my pregnant pause. Next, please. Okay, if I go back to the previous one, please. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, this is an example of a frayed conveyor belt uh, on a roller that's got um, degraded uh, metal. So you've got a hole in the roller, and then you've got the degraded uh, conveyor belt. In both of these circumstances, um, pathogens can find harbored sites, and they're almost impossible to keep clean and sanitary. So maintenance needs to remove these from service and, um, and do significant remediation. Next, please. And then here I've got a eroded floor drain. Uh, this is an example of a Listeria harbored site that's very well known in the industry. And you can look at some of the temporary repairs that have been tried over the years. And this new poured concrete, now you've got multiple gaps and crevices. Um, just a complete nightmare to keep sanitary. So this needs to be completely re-engineered and, and removed. Next, please. So I'm almost done with my overview. Hopefully you've seen the importance of maintenance. If you've got uh, a facility that is not well maintained, then all your food safety intervention efforts are going to be uh, for naught. So when it comes comes time to testing uh, these environments, I think it's really important for you to consider um, past history and trends, again, the features of the plant. If you've got an old plant that requires lots of preventative maintenance, I think I would argue you need lots of testing to make sure that these uh, maintenance activities are achieving the desired outcome. Depends on the type of product and, and volume and the size of the plant, plant layout and product flow. Next, please. Anytime you have any disruptive events in the facility, it's really important for you to do uh, aggressive environmental monitoring because these disruptive events can have a huge impact on releasing these pathogen harborage sites and letting the pathogens get out in the facility. So here are some examples. So anytime you change ingredients, leaky roof, drain backups, construction events, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you need to do uh, more in aggressive investigational monitoring to make sure your facility is um, under control. Next, please. So some routine preventative, mate, um, preventative maintenance um, measures then for you are controlling your sources of these vector areas, uh, repairing structural damage immediately. I mean, this should not be something you wait on the next budget cycle to deal with. Uh, these are something you need to attend to right away, and you can use your data points to make that argument. And then review and monitor your GMPs, SOPs, and your audits. So I want to thank you very much. We're going to hold questions to the end. And uh, we've got another polling question before Rudy gets to stage. Genevieve, thank you. Hey, Doug. Okay, our next polling question is, do you have a pre-op maintenance checklist? And that will launch now. I will leave it open for about 30 seconds. All right, and now I'm going to close. And here are the results: about 60% yes, yeah. and 40% no. Okay. And now I will pass the presentation off to Rudy. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rudy Grappi. I'm the president of Heinz and Manufacturing. Um, Heinzen is a company that's focused on the fresh cut produce industry. 
Uh, majority of our projects are turnkey based projects from typically raw product to finished product. Um, <clears throat> uh, we focus on the North American market, but we have done projects uh, all over the world of varying scope and size. Um, today, next please, there we go. Uh, I'm going to kind of go over our observations as an equipment manufacturer as we kind of go in and out of many companies um, that are great partners of Heinz and Manufacturing, just our observations on some of the dynamics between the food safety um, efforts and the maintenance efforts. Um, the bulleted points uh, I'll cover in detail. Um, there still is a big gap in education, um, especially with the, the dynamic workforce and the maintenance areas. You've got very highly skilled people. I'll talk a little bit about the skill sets. Um, many companies are still trying to embrace the culture change from how you used to run the plant with very limited process controls to diving into more process controls. Um, staffing challenges are obvious everywhere. <clears throat> um, dive in a little bit about pre-op inspections and how they can really transform your business. Um, and then go into the term PEC, which is periodic equipment cleaning. Um, that's now being embraced by many companies as we have good, good written SSOPs on all equipment. And then just looking at planning um, as your every company is running full tilt, uh, most of the time you're in overload mode. How do you plan effectively just stepping back and looking at the big picture? And then kind of closing out with legacy equipment, uh, which every plant has got uh, many generations from could be 20 year old to even five year old equipment um, versus some new equipment and getting a good specification if you are writing some new equipment um, and the cost savings and going that route. So on the education side of it, we heard Doug talk about um, a good portion of this, but in the fresh cut world, if you're in a wet, washed down duty environment, um, the real enemy is listeria and listeria mitigation, how you can control it. And the food safety professionals that are out there that are continually swabbing and looking for this stuff are, are very good at um, understanding where it can hide. But the maintenance side of it, and anybody that could be an engineering doing capital projects, uh, because there's you know obviously a whole different thought process that goes into uh, building equipment, putting a project together. Oftentimes, their budget constraint, um, which can lead to maybe a construction standard that could have some of these areas where listeria could hide. So getting everybody on the same page and continuing that education process of where listeria hides is extremely important. Um, and then also understanding how does it move in a facility. So uh, from our experience, we know that uh, laminations in zone one, um, although you may be testing, swabbing, not finding anything after your sanitation cycle, um, Due to the machine vibrations and um, all the movement that could happen that any pathogens that are in a lamination in a zone one area will eventually migrate out and that's been uh, you know one of the biggest challenges for us as equipment manufacturer and other equipment manufacturers is how do you eliminate laminations on zone one surfaces um, as the biggest cause for cross-contamination uh, you know, then looking at mapping people out, Doug talked about people mapping. I will talk a little bit about more about zone mapping. Uh, I think a lot of uh, <clears throat> companies are just now starting to embrace zone mapping in your facility and especially how it pertains to, to maintenance workers. Uh, we have learned now the best practices for sanitation workers is you have a separate drain crew. Um, that they basically may be garbed differently, they may have different color brushes. And they are zoned, they've got carts for just cleaning the drains versus anybody that may be cleaning from floor level up, having that segregated. I think that same thought process needs to migrate in across some of the maintenance workers um, for if you're in a raw product area, 
Um, you're authorized to maintain equipment in those areas, which could be forklifts, hand trucks, um, doors, floors, walls, et cetera, versus the high care ready to eat zones, making sure that those employees are actually trained and signed off for that environment. So embracing a culture change. Um, we as a company started down uh, this journey about 2012, uh, looking at how do we improve our product lines, how do we get every employee um, living and breathing hygienic design and understanding sanitary design. And it, it takes a while. Um, it takes continual uh, training um, and reinforcement. Um, we like to talk about comprehension here as a company and we have a lot of meetings where everybody nods their head, I comprehend, I got it, I got it. And then typical, you roll down two or three months later and the retention uh, from that training event may have been discarded or not taken as seriously as you need to take it. So how do you get to, how do you get things to stick? So embedding the, the, sanit the principles of sanitary design into your core values at every level is really the goal to force culture change and then extending that out uh, for us as an equipment manufacturer we like to extend out um, to facility contractors our equipment suppliers um, that could be partners in the process obviously we don't build every piece of equipment in a process line so we're integrating equipment from Urschel and Ashita and Hasten um, and all the other ceiling bagging companies so we want to make sure that we are all speaking the same language. So we're continually reaching out to our partners in industry and then also equipment installers. Um, maintenance typically gets thrust into capital project mode. And that's another you know, log that gets thrown on their fire um, as they're trying to put out fires. It just flames the other side of preventive maintenance of not getting done or being backburnered. So how do we get equipment installers on the same page from a hygienic standpoint as the original equipment coming in? And then kind of parallel to the contractors and processes we deal with internally, um, the food safety group between maintenance group and sanitation, you know, we observe that there is definitely a functional boundary between all three of these steps. Um, and how do you get push-pull and some dynamics so we can all get along? Um, you know, it's very uh, common to be sitting in a, a meeting talking about uh, maintenance not getting this done, and the food safety says, well, it needs to get done, and then sanitation says, well, you don't get, we don't, we need time to sanitize, and maintenance is looking at, well, I need time to access the line. So if you can obviously combine some of the maintenance steps with the sanitation steps, you can compress time a little bit, and, uh, and gain a little bit on the hygienic side. So we like to also talk about are we armed and dangerous. For us as a company, that relates to hygienic design, sanitary design. We want all of our employees to own it. And when they do have an issue of a machine design project or how do we clean the equipment, we want them to know how to handle it and how to, how to solve the problem. So the next slide, sanitary design guiding principles. Um, there's a lot of information on the internet. Um, you can Google it. There's many organizations that have written these guiding principles. And these are very high level guiding principles. They're not a how to. So as you start to develop checklists, you can start to standardize your how to do it. How do we handle the situation for each company that uh, and each process problem um, you're faced with. Uh, Doug talked about um, define hygienic zones based on a low risk to high risk definition. Um, this is a, on your screen is a plan view of kind of a, a simple plant layout that shows a raw product area on the left. And then as the process goes from left to right, we go into high hygienic zone and then the finished product areas. Um, the colors, color coding really helps educate employees. Um, you know, you roll back, and even today, a lot of companies with um, maintenance um, 
workers that may have been around for 10 or 15 years, there have been very, it's very common for them not to have to suit up or garb up when they walk into the plant. Uh, we're seeing that uh, the same hygienic standards now are being applied to maintenance workers, but there's still that old school mentality of um, how we handle equipment, how we work on equipment. But getting um, the tool bin slide that Doug showed is really good. Um, having that in high care area, so if um, you do a pre-op inspection and there's a, a tweaking or an issue that has to happen on a piece of equipment, um, having some tools there that are specifically set up for that Urschel slicer or that washer or bagger that are locked down right in high care so you don't have to actually leave the space to make an adjustment. You can do it right there. The tools live and stay in that area and they're sanitized um, via the same protocols as any piece of equipment. So moving on to staffing challenges, um, every company out there is, from my polling, that has a job ad for a maintenance worker, maintenance supervisor, forklift mechanics um, at every level. So if you look at um, how do we find these people, how do we capture them, and how do we get them trained, um, you know, these employees make the biggest impact to food safety every day. So categorizing your maintenance guys and recognizing them, we all know recognition is a great method of um, actually maintaining employees, and sometimes it extends past the uh, compensation model for that employee. Recognize who your highly skilled uh, maintenance workers are, and have they been trained in hygienic design, sanitary design? And, you know, guys that are out on the floor working on equipment, certificates mean a lot to them. Training, that's, that's how they justify as they move up the food chain, responsibility skill-wise. So recognize the guys that are your highly skilled, bagger scale, automation, PLC, maintenance workers. Um, get them tied into uh, some training up events with your food safety leads on the floor, maybe your sanitation leads for different areas, and having some meetings uh, where you can actually talk about the issues between maintenance and sanitation, what steps can be combined. Um, and then recognizing who your general maintenance guys are, the jack of all trades that are keyed in on conveyors, slicers, dryers, and any special equipment you have in your area. And then looking outside the, uh, the high care environment, um, there's a lot of support equipment that could be vehicles for cross-contamination, um, recognizing which employees are dedicated to refrigeration, your air compressor system, hydraulics, lighting, all those support areas. Um, and I think the, the biggest impact is just training these guys to know what a zone one, zone two, zone three surface is. Um, I think a lot of zone Two surfaces present the biggest threat. Um, and maintenance guys don't really understand the concept of if that area gets wet or if there's microbes growing in that lamination, can a drip drainer be drawn onto a zone one surface? Um, and that's uh, a big issue with every plant, especially with a lot of the legacy equipment out there that literally cannot be retrofitted because of that issue. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in upcoming slides. So moving on to the, the daily pre-op checklist, um, this is a part of everybody's life. It was good to see there's a big uh, component. The well, majority of the companies are, have, do have some form of a pre-op checklist. Um, I think there's, there can be a lot of improvement in linking the, not only the, the safety of the, of the equipment and the maintenance function and the food safety and in that pre-op checklist. Um, we are uh, very, uh, we, we live and kind of subscribe to uh, the checklist manifesto. As a company, we uh, watch some of the videos on YouTube uh, once a year. We kind of re refresh our efforts on it. Uh, Atul Gawande has a lot of great points in here. And we have employee turnover, just like every company has employee turnover. 
and how do you capture tribal knowledge? Um, every company has tribal knowledge in every process that they deal with. But as you start to grow and develop these checklists, you can start to capture some of your tribal knowledge, especially if it's a key area or a hotspot, um, if you've had known issues. Um, I think some of the biggest benefits we've seen from a pre-op checklist is actually requiring maintenance to, to walk alongside uh, QA or food safety. Um, as QA people turn over, they may not realize that, oh, that machine was not put together correctly after sanitation. Um, we've seen a lot of issues where um, second shift or first shift or somebody doesn't show up that day that normally does the checklist. Um, there's a lot of gaps in correctly reassembling the line after the sanitation event. So tying that pre-op checklist together um, and does your check checklist drive a CM event? And when I say CM, that's, that means it's a crisis maintenance event. So if you do have a crisis of maintenance event, so you saw the uh, duck slide with the fraying conveyor belt, and obviously that conveyor belt had been frayed for quite a long time. The carry roller had a hole in it. That hole has been there for quite a long time. So where in your organization are you capturing that issue? Where does it rate in the food chain from does maintenance, is this a shutdown event for the line? Or does this get on a future PM schedule? And also, does it help drive the corrective action? And obviously, the conveyor belt and that return roller does need to be done at some point, but then there's always a cost involved with it. Um, every company has got cost constraints. Um, we know that if you can tie it to food safety, um, every organization realizes that that is kind of the holy grail of getting money approved, but there's always constraints on that money. And you have to prioritize um, by those events, but getting it on the list is the first step. Um, just uh, the point of this slide was uh, just looking at who signs off that the machine is ready to run. Um, who will hit the e-stop button in the event of a risk? Will maintenance stop a line? Will sanitation? Will food safety or will production? So these are all different groups, different teams in your organization. Getting them all on the same page, you know, is is a continual battle and continual challenge. Having a checklist which forces that pre-op op step to be written, um, and then it can be pushed up the food chain for going all the way to the operations manager, president of the company based on uh, what needs to happen. And oftentimes it means spending some money to fix a problem. So, so the PEC, periodic equipment cleaning side, um, is something that uh, most companies now are actually getting these in writing um, and developing these into your SSOP, your master sanitation program. Um, the picture below shows a uh, our latest generation spin dryer. I'll kind of go through um, some design changes on this dryer, which was um, kind of designed from the ground up to adhere to the 10 principles of sanitary design. And also looking at the PEC equipment disassembly, the old design had quite a, quite a few steps to go through to really clean it. Um, and I saw some of Doug's slides indicated a frequency how often do you need to disassemble? Um, I think that needs to, to be backed up with some data. So the food safety group probably needs to be swabbing. They need to be inspecting some of these areas based on risk. And getting that, that needs to be disassembled at least once a year, four times a year, once a month, every two weeks type table setup. Um, I talked a little about compressing time. And as we all know, every organization has got time constraints. So if you look at a piece of equipment, say like an Urschel translicer or an Urschel dicer, almost every company has one of those in their facilities. You may have a, a daily cleaning protocol and you may have a weekly deep clean protocol on that. 
what does that equate to in number of people and number of minutes to actually effectively do that? Um, and then also, as we look at developing a standard PECs in the PM maintenance process for maybe uh, bearing replacement, uh, conveyor belt replacement, wear strip replacement on conveyor belting, um, what other steps can automatically be done to that? And capturing that via a, a, a replace bearing type checklist. If you're going to pull the bearings off, you probably had to pull the gearbox and the motor off. There's a lot of mating surfaces there that need to be cleaned. Um, if they're painted drives or painted uh, gearboxes and motors, is the paint flaking? Is that over a zone one surface? Um, which could then drive, hey, we need to upgrade, upgrade this drive. Uh, I think uh, we have a lot of case history just in some Listeria issues with our equipment where the maintenance group may have been taking that motor on and off once a month or every four months, and none of the mating surfaces were ever sanitized. So are there steps that you can write in to train the maintenance group that those mating surfaces will biofilm if it's a cast iron component bolted to a stainless component, there'll be cross-contamination. The uh, iron will start to grow onto the stainless, creating a very rough, porous surface. Now, when you break that apart, now's the time to scrape those surfaces clean um, and get them dressed up as, as good as possible. So, uh, as a company, uh, we've worked with uh, commercial food sanitations, a focus on the food industry on developing our sanitation passport program, which uh, we provide a uh, SSOP with all equipment, kind of a standardized document. Um, there is some repetitive, repetitive nature between each document, but it does create a framework for a lot of companies that have received this to start upgrading their existing uh, documentation. Step six is the area I think which needs to be really focused on uh, by all the groups. The pre-op um, inspection for where can you uh, can you bring maintenance and, and food safety and sanitation together. I'm having um, a good pack procedure. Um, we've been doing our best to go through and identify some of the steps um, with some pictures simple disassembly steps um, on the equipment. It's always good at some point if you have somebody maybe from uh, QA Food Safety uh, show up on a Sunday when you've got a full disassembly procedure scheduled on this equipment um, just to learn and understand. Um, and oftentimes, you know, we talked about the schedule about Sundays you know, your maintenance guys, as every company goes through staffing shortages, they're rotating through for that Sunday work. Um, they may want to start at 4 a.m. if it's football season to get out of the plant by 10 or 11 in the morning. So it's it's a continual battle to, um, to uh, get those guys in there and stay on schedule. So part of the, the equipment process, maintenance process, is really just planning for success. Um, we as a company, um, we have a chart similar to this, but it's more geared around equipment installations. Um, we typically have a crew leaving on a Thursday or Friday flying somewhere in North America, um, working Saturday, Sunday. Uh, majority of the crew flies back Monday. We may leave one or two guys around for startup assistance, and then they fly back Tuesday. And we have a chart that says here's what weekends we have available for that kind of weekend warrior project. Uh, so if you look at diluting that now with the time constraints of six holidays, um, and not a whole lot of maintenance activity will happen on these days, although if you pay double time rates or premium plus rates for those weekends, yes, there'll be a group of guys that will rally um, on those holidays to come in and work. But then as also, there's also another constraint on the holiday workload, which is additional maintenance support. Um, the plant was shut down. Now you're bringing everything from a down, being down for a day or two. There's always seems to be startup issues. So you need to have additional maintenance there 
which they're not doing a lot of PM type work, but they are supporting. So out of your 52 available days for your full equipment disassembly, less the holidays, um, we threw in kind of audit prep and crisis maintenance because those always crop in. You end up with really 36 actual days um, to, to complete this type of work. Um, so what falls short on these days? You know, obviously Santa works on his holiday, but do we always get maintenance guys in there working on those holidays? So thought points, um, very, uh, very common is um, Mother's Day weekend's coming up, and we men, you know, we like to buy a lot of processed foods. So before Mother's Day, uh, the plant needs to run for three weeks straight. Now what? So out of your 36 available weekends, um, you now are down to 33 days that uh, um, you've just lost because of sales. Sales did a good job. They brought in a lot of work. So it leads to a lot of other questions. Um, if you had an audit at that point and it was swabbed, what would happen? So I, I think that's where doing things dynamically with the uh, pre-op checklist, getting maintenance involved in that process so they're geared up as you go through and start a lineup. Um, and there will be known hot spots in every process line. Getting that written down on a list can help drive um, a lot of cost reduction. So speaking of cost reduction, um, the picture on the left was the old generation centrifuge spin dryer that we built. Uh, we'd gone through about five generational changes on this design. Uh, it really came to the point where the, the infrastructure needed to change a little bit. Um, there was quite a bit of time associated with um, cleaning some of the zone two areas. Um, which uh, took about two and a half hours to clean each area. The new generation, which is down to uh, significantly less time uh, to sanitize, um, was really a, you know an effort bringing in the maintenance group. What are your hot spots? Bringing in the, the food safety group. What are the issues there? Uh, Genevieve, could you advance to the next slide? I've lost control. So you can see the, the old design, you physically had to unbolt the lid, remove the spider plate. The, the latch had to be manually disassembled. Um, the bottom basket support had to be disassembled. Um, the new design we went through and um, eliminated all fasteners in zone one. Um, the laminations are now moved outside that area to uh, simplify the cleaning process and what went to a uh, about a hour and a half cleaning schedule with about four hours of maintenance time per week dropped down to um, um, uh, 30 minutes of sanitation time and 15 minutes of sanitation of maintenance time. So pretty big reduction in that aspect. Um, so if you crank that out in the savings. Um, uh, my screen's a little cut off on the bottom, but it adds up pretty quickly. And doing a master plan for your PEC disassembly um, and PMs added into that, uh, once you actually chart that out, it could be a bit shocking. Uh, we worked this exercise with a few customers, and it quickly came down to, wow, you've got to really prioritize um, because you physically don't have enough bodies to fill all the available minutes for doing a full comprehensive PM and PEC program. So kind of closing out my presentation, I'm gonna dive in a little bit more about education. Um, every plant in North America has legacy equipment. Um, and we're often asked this question, is it bad? Um, what's wrong with piano hinge? What's wrong with the bolt in this area? I've got UHMW skirting bolted on to my product guide on my conveyor belt. Is that really bad? Um, so we've come up with a couple educational tools. The Legacy Equipment Guide and the Survival Guide are great tools. Um, if you go to our website, you can see the link there on Legacy Equipment. Um, this is kind of designed as an 
interactive um, type of um, program. So you can click on one of the down aerials to bring up uh, kind of equipment marking, are the stickers, what are the issues, um, what are your options, uh, pros and cons. And as we continually work these issues on our old designs, migrating them to new channelized designs, uh, we are continually updating the content in this list. So here's just a screenshot from the website from drive components to gauges to belting. A lot of good information there, especially if you're a new QA person that, or food safety professional, you're really now tasked with becoming a design engineer. Uh, we've got food safety now sitting at the table for capital projects. And you've got engineers that know how to build a great piece of equipment, make it reliable. Now we need everybody's thinking cap on how do we get that new piece of equipment to be food safe and cleanable with no tools and only take five minutes to do a full deep clean down to a microbial level. So the second part of the educational piece to close out is the uh, what we're calling our survival guide for fresh cut processing equipment. It's rooted in the 10 principles of sanitary design. Uh, we've come up with nine categories. Um, there's about 100 lists, 100 bullet points in this checklist. Uh, the link below will take you right to the PDF you can download. Uh, but it, it's something we live every day. Um, we've been working the 10 principles of sanitary design since 2012 as a company. Um, we complete this uh, checklist on every piece of equipment, training all our engineers. But we quickly realized that it's, you live a lot of the same issues. The principles root you in that value you want to get to, but it's not a how-to. Uh, it doesn't capture your tribal knowledge on say, what type of conveyor belt am I going to use for my high hygienic environment, clearing, carrying product that has gone through all the microbial reduction steps? So obviously that's a question every company has to ask themselves and then take a look at what kind of conveyor belt is my current product being conveyed on. And there's good, better, best options at each step of the way. There's a cost associated with each one of those. So that wraps up my portion portion of the presentation. And Genevieve, I'm going to hand it back to you. And thank you, uh, everybody who's been listening. All right. Thank you, Rudy. Um, thank you, Doug and Rudy, for your presentations. Now we will move into a short Q&A session. Um, you can continue to submit questions during this. Um, any questions that we don't get to, uh, Doug and Rudy will follow up afterwards on an individual basis. And so let me look for our first question. Okay, first question. Um, what are some typical specifications for the various zones? Yeah, so uh, as a company, we've been presenting for United Fresh PMA Listeria Workshops. Um, you can find that presentation on the PMA website. Uh, I do go into uh, type of surfaces, finishes, weld qualities. Um, and if you want to follow up with me after the meeting via email, I can, sh I can send you some information on that. But obviously, your smoothest surfaces, no laminations, no bolt heads in zone one, welds, no corner welds, if you can form the, uh, the, the metal and perform a butt weld so you don't have a porous corner weld uh, for your zone one areas would be ideal. All right, um, we're going to do just one last question. You said floor drains can be a nightmare for to keep sanitary. What advice would you give on keeping drains safe and sanitary do you have any recommendations beyond daily cleaning that might eliminate potential for pathogens and or contamination? Um, yeah, I'll comment on that. You know, you know, what lurks below is always the most concerning. How far down and where does that drain go? So I think every company needs to, to look at, if you don't have a drain map, uh, maybe talk to some people out in the industry, how do I map those drains to know where they go? 
especially if they're flowing from raw product through your high hygienic area, which could be the case in a lot of older facilities. A lot of microbes live and grow. And what if that drain backs up? So the drain, we all know that hoses in those areas, there can be aerosols. But the biggest threat is if your floor drain backs up and you've got everything that's been living below now migrates up to maybe a three or four inch level of standing water in your facility. So every foot pad, every threaded connection at that floor, every hollow tubing has just been contaminated. So that would be one of the biggest things is can you eliminate floor drain backups? And obviously there's a lot of great hygienic floor drains out there. It may mean an actual floor retrofit to uh, clean up those drains. Thank you. I'd also, I'd also recommend um, having a very good discussion with your sanitation chemical supply house because they have a number of products that are uh, specifically designed to control microbes and floor drains. But as Rudy alluded to, uh, um, if it's a really a degraded drain, a replacement is probably your best fix. Yeah, just one last comment, Genevieve, on this is categorization. You know, with your crew segregation, have a dedicated drain crew, have a dedicated cart for all their tools, and just guarantee that any brush or tool to open a drain where the drain's set, it doesn't get anywhere near, you know, zone two or zone one surface is real critical. Um, we've seen equipment get cross contaminated from brushes. Um, even though they've been very strong caustics using it, that a couple of microbes will survive that process and cross contaminate. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Rudy and Doug, for your expertise and your presentations. I want to remind everyone that a recording of this webinar, along with a copy of the slides, will be available to you within three business days. This will come as an email. Um, giving you access to both of these resources. All right, thank you.